Hi, Phil. Thank it's you. great to see you. And I've enjoyed all the speakers so far. This has been really cool. Uh, so thanks for inviting me to join you. And for the folks who are listening, um, this conversation uh, started with um, Phil watching a talk that I gave at CES. Uh, just a month ago, uh, you know, CES, a giant uh, trade show for big corporations. And so my focus there was um, on the corporate metaverse, uh, the idea that these corporations are all out to build their own version of a metaverse and try to get us all trapped into it. And I wanted to appeal to the enlightened self-interest of those companies and point out to them that if what they're building is kind of like a virtual theme park or a virtual shopping mall, or God help us, a virtual corporate office park, um, I don't think those are going to be very lively places. Uh, they're not designed for sociability. And they're going to have trouble recruiting people to participate in those things in a meaningful way over a long haul. Uh, so Phil invited me to build on that idea. And so as I thought about it a little bit further for today's talk, I thought, you know, actually what we're in danger of is kind of mindlessly sleepwalking into replicating uh, the colonial system. And so to explain that, I'm going to turn to some slides and bear with me as I set this up and get started. The question I want to talk about today is whether we will be citizens or subjects of the metaverse. And so here we go. Um, to begin, I'm gonna talk about dematerialization. It's a topic I'm fascinated about. I've been studying it for about 10 years. And I think it's the mega trend that defines everything that's going on because what we're really talking about is building virtual worlds or dematerialized worlds, building them in software. Now, everybody's familiar with miniaturization. Miniaturization is the process of frankly, doing more with less. That's the phrase that Buckminster Fuller used back in the 1960s to encourage us to consider how to use less material. This picture illustrates it beautifully. In a 60 year span, we've gone from a, 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 a hard drive that needed a forklift. It was so heavy and it was only a five megabyte hard drive uh, and it cost about $120,000. And of course, today you have a terabyte of data and it's the size of a quarter. You can stick it in your pocket and it costs a few bucks. Uh, so we've had a 200 billion fold increase in improvements and efficiency and a reduction of cost uh, over a 60 year span. So that's miniaturization, but that's only one part of dematerialization. Dematerialization is a gigantic trend, but it's mostly invisible. I believe it's the most significant trend that will define the 21st century. Every company needs to take this very seriously. You need a dematerialization strategy. And we talk about dematerialization, and that's such a long word, you know, dematerialization into software or dematerialization into pure information. The term I use for it is vaporized, and that's the title of my book, my book on the subject of dematerialization into software, replacing physical stuff with software. And that's basically been made possible or accelerated, I guess, by the smartphone. In the past 15 years, we've been in the wholesale process of converting physical assets into digital data. It's information as atmosphere, and it's all around us. It's available anytime, just by the touch of an icon on your phone. You can add functionality and data to your phone anytime that you want to. And in the process, we're replacing a lot of things. We're getting rid of a lot of things, and we're losing a lot of consumer habits. Everybody on this call who's from the media industry knows exactly what I'm talking about because we've already vaporized books, music, maps, games, and the television business. We're replacing those all with either downloadable or streaming media services. So this is the process of replacing a physical thing like a CD or a DVD or a game cartridge with software. But this process is not limited to media, maps, and music. No, it extends to physical devices as well. In the last 15 years, your smartphone's gotten a lot smarter because it's absorbed the functionality of about 25 different consumer electronics devices. And so today, you don't really need to buy a camera. You don't need to buy a GPS unit because you've got that feature functionality built into your phone as software. And for the companies that made MP3 players or the ones that made portable nav systems or, uh, or digital cameras, any kind of digital gizmo, those companies have experienced double digit de decreases in sales. It's been absolutely devastating for the Japanese electronics companies, for instance. Meanwhile, in the same interval, in a 10 year span from the beginning of the smartphone era to about 2016, we saw that the smartphone market share increased by 500 fold. So really what's happening is the smartphone industry and by and large, the information industry is absorbing not just the feature functionality, but also the profits from the companies that used to make consumer electronics, media, and many other businesses. In economics, the term we use for this is demand destruction. Demand destruction, it used to be quite rare because it's very rare to completely replace uh, a consumer's habits. You know, for the example they generally give is if you buy an electronic car, electric vehicle, um, you're going you're gonna to experience demand destruction because you no longer need to stop at a gas station. So they've destroyed your demand for gas. But what's happening with the smartphone is we're doing demand destruction on a massive scale 
across many different industries. And the value of that is being absorbed by a handful of companies. Now, this process is hard to see. So you might not notice it, but now that I've given you this talk, you're going to start to see it everywhere around you. For instance, Uber and other car share companies, ride share companies are conditioning us to the notion that you no longer need to purchase or own a car. You can have transportation on demand just by touching an icon on your phone and it's right there for you. It's all for you. And a whole generation is raised now with the idea that they don't need driver's licenses or cars to get around town. And that is ultimately an exist existential crisis for the auto industry because those customers will purchase fewer cars in their lifetime. It's gonna shrink that industry. Something similar is happening with dating. Now in the United States and many other countries across all genders and orientations, we're starting to see that most people are finding their mate through a wireless app, a dematerialized dating service. During the pandemic, we got to see doctors on our smartphones as well. So we experienced dematerialized medical care. And now coming out of the pandemic, we're gonna experience that when we go to hotels. So when you come to your hotel, you're gonna see it's quite reconfigured uh, for a completely different experience uh, in the sense that a lot of the services that they used to have, hotels, concierge services, and so forth, those services have also been replaced by apps. It's essentially, the, the hotels won't offer those services anymore because they'll expect you to do that on your phone. So I believe that whatever can be vaporized will be vaporized. Now, this, this field is growing at an incredible clip. When I wrote my book, I spoke to W. Bryant Arthur, who's an economist at the Santa Fe Institute, and he told me that the vaporized economy grows at twice the rate of the real economy. You can see that illustrated in this chart, uh, just the growth of the app economy uh, in the past six or seven years. Uh, the great beneficiaries of this, of course, are the information companies. So in 2016, Apple was the most valuable company in the world, became the most valuable company in the world, valued at about $570 billion at that time. What's interesting about that is that just 15 years before, Apple was only worth $5 billion. So they had a hundredfold increase in the value of the company largely thanks to the iPhone. Uh, the other leading companies on the Fortune 500 were, of course, all the other tech companies that are listed here. Now, over the next couple of years, they grew tremendously fast. Uh, Apple grew by 50% in a two-year span from 2016 to 2018. And the other companies on this chart also added about $250 billion to their market caps in that two-year span, but they didn't stop there. By the end of 2018, Apple became the first company to cross the $1 trillion threshold, and Amazon followed them briefly. Um, by 2020, just before the pandemic, most of these companies were hovering around the $1 trillion mark, and Apple was already at $1.4 trillion. So they had a threefold increase. Uh, Facebook had had a couple of bad revelations, some bad news, and of course, they were lingering a little bit behind there. Now, after the pandemic, what we've seen is a tremendous surge. So today, uh, my chart is too big to fit on the screen. Apple's now hovering around $3 trillion in value. They've had about a six-fold increase in valuation since 2016. Alphabet, Microsoft, and Amazon are all in the range of over 1 million, closing in on 2 trillion of value. Uh, but Facebook's had a terrible quarter, and so they've had a big setback. And in a moment, I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening with Facebook. But first, what I want to do is talk a little bit more about what might come next. Because Apple and company are not going to stop where they are. They continue to grow. They intend to grow. It's already priced into the stock. And in some investors, and now some publications, are starting to speculate that Apple could reach the 5 trillion threshold, $5 trillion of value. Remember, they're going to do that by vaporizing other industries. So this is a matter of concern. If you're not working at that company, this affects every single one of us. And of course, a lot of companies are concerned. A lot of people are worried. They feel like they might be in the gun sites of Apple, Amazon, Google, and so on. So we wonder who's next. And of course, clearly healthcare is a bloated and inefficient business with a lousy consumer experience. So it's ripe for disruption. And surely already, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google have massive health initiatives. According to Kathy, uh, Kathy Woods at ARC, $8 trillion of value is at risk if this industry gets replaced by information services. The retail industry has been under assault for the past 10 years. That won't stop. $2 trillion at risk. The banking and payments business is already being unbundled as mobile apps. That's about $3 trillion at risk. And the transportation industry is also at risk, about $8 trillion of value. I talked a little bit about Uber, but we also know that uh, a giant robot car initiative is underway at Google, and Apple has some sort of car initiative as well. So it's not impossible that we'll see some sort of kind of car coming from Silicon Valley that's not built by Tesla in the not too distant future. So one way for these companies to continue to grow is to continue to blow up and vaporize other industries. Another way for them to grow is to mimic what's happening in China and now more broadly elsewhere in Asia, and that's with a super app. If you're not familiar with what a super app is, let me tell you about that. A super app uh, here in the United States 
our experience is uh, sort of at the top of that chart, what you can see is that it's a standalone app. That's mostly what we experience when we go to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, a uh, stand, single standalone app. You download, they do one thing really, really well. Now, increasingly, companies like Microsoft and Adobe are introducing something like an app suite. So it's a little bundle of apps that work together. But in China, they moved much faster to a different model, something called a super app. And now these become very, very uh, extensive and rather sophisticated. A super app consists of a single app. Usually it starts with messaging or a payment system. And then they start to bolt down other functionalities and eventually turn it into a platform. You can think of it as an app that contains an app store. And uh, now companies like um, WeChat, Paytm, um, Baidu and so forth. These companies are growing extraordinarily large. They're the largest companies in each of their countries, respectively, and they're expanding outside of Asia now into Africa and to Latin America. So a lot of people speculate that maybe Apple, Amazon, and Google are going to move into the super app business. That's another possible future for them. But Facebook, as I mentioned, is going in a completely different direction. And as they famously said, the CEO famously said last, last winter, he announced that Facebook is now going to become a company. It's called Meta, and they're going to be focused on the metaverse. Now, you've heard about that from other speakers. I don't need to recap that. One of the reasons Facebook is doing this is because they want to sell hardware. They feel like the fact that they don't sell a smartphone prevents them from maximizing their market share and their valuation. It's one of the reasons why they're penalized in the market. So they're hoping that we're all going to go out and buy an Oculus uh, face gear or maybe uh, some sort of goggles in the future, some AR goggles or something like that. They think that'll be their path to controlling customers. What I want to talk about is why digital worlds are so important for companies like Meta and for many other companies in the field. A few years ago, Kevin Kelly, the exec executive editor at Wired, wrote this interesting article where he talked about digitizing the whole world. He said, we're at the brink of a new platform, the third platform after mobile and the web before it. The third platform will digitize the rest of the world, the whole world. We're talking about digital twins for everything. This is the area I've been focused on in my practice for the last five years. And trust me, this is well underway. Companies are trying to digitize every single thing on the planet, trying to create high resolution digital models of everything on the planet, call it mirror world. And what Kevin Kelly wrote is that whoever dominates this grand third platform will become among the wealthiest and most powerful people and companies in history. Think about that for a second. When you think about that, you say, well, wait a minute, who were the most powerful corporations in history? Weren't they companies like Apple and Amazon and Google? The answer is no. As a matter of fact, there were much more powerful companies in the past. They were the very first modern multinational corporations, the first venture traded companies, the first publicly traded stocks, and the first global trading firms. Of course, what I'm referring to is the United Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. And these are the logos of those two famous companies. For about 400 years, these companies dominated about a quarter of the Earth's surface. They colonized it. They had a very simple business model. Invade other countries, take over the entire, public, the entire population, the entire society, economy, and the nation, subjugate it and manage it for profit. That was the business model of these companies. They were hyper-centralized. For 200 years, 17 men in Amsterdam dictated what happened to millions of people in East Asia. The Dutch East India Company was the first company to go public. And in fact, they created the Amsterdam stock market to make that public trade possible. The Dutch East India Company issued its own currency. It had its own Navy and its own army. At one point in 1737, at the peak, they were estimated to be worth more than all of the tech stocks in the world today. Now that's highly contested because it depends on how you evaluate or evaluate those companies. Um, but by some other calculations, they were worth at least $8 trillion, maybe $9 trillion in today's money. So that would make them at least as big or bigger than the collection of the companies I was talking about just a moment ago. So these were truly the biggest companies, but the Dutch East India Company was supplanted by the British East India Company the British East India Company eventually over a 200 year span dominated the former Mughal Empire in India and began to extract the wealth from that place and send that wealth back to shareholders in England. That's the business model. Invade a place, take out the valuable assets and ship them someplace else to shareholders elsewhere. These were not the only companies that did that. There were dozens and dozens of these companies from Europe that were chartered by the crown to go create a monopoly someplace else in the world. And the basic business model was go over there, you have a monopoly to trade, conquer those people, extract the very good resources, extract the valuable resources, and send them back to us. That was the business model. Eventually, by the 19th century, three quarters of the planet had been under colonization at one point or another. And even this map's a little deceptive. 
because the purple thing on the right, that's Europe, but the big inland empires of Russia and Austria are included in that. And so there was some element of colonization that's happening there as well. Really only five countries haven't been subject to uh, um, colonization and those include Thailand, Japan, and Korea. Now, when I was a kid, I was indoctrinated in the understanding that someone like Christopher Columbus brought enlightenment and liberty and peace and justice to the new world. Those are lies. Those are lies that I was taught in school. It's not true. The process was brutal savagery, including butchery, mass wholesale slaughter of populations. If they couldn't get their way diplomatically, then they sent in the army and killed people. The whole point of this was to carve up the world for profit. These are lands that are controlled for profit. Now, you might think that that's something in the past. You might think, well, didn't we end that colonial period? Haven't we been going through the past 75 years, a process of decolonization? I'd love to talk about that. I don't have time to get into that subject today, but I just want to take a second to point out that actually lots of countries still have territories. What's a territory? The United States has 14 territories. Why do we have 14 territories? What are territories? The United States used to be a colony. We have a very uneasy relationship with the word colony, so we don't use that word to describe the islands in the Pacific and the islands in the Caribbean that we control. Uh, but these are islands where the citizens do not have the same rights as people that live in mainland United States. Today, we're haunted by artifacts of the colonial era. They're everywhere. In any country that was previously subjugated and ruled by colony, we inherited a lot of structures that were built at that time including national boundaries that were drawn in an arbitrary way by somebody usually in an office in London that creates ethnic conflicts that persist to this day. This process of exploiting humans for profit continues to be a problem. The eradication of indigenous culture is something we're still grappling with. Racism, sexism, and class hierarchy are still encoded in the legal systems that we inherited. And international capitalism, globalized trade and, and commodities rest on a very awful foundation. It's an extraction economy supported by predatory financing and backed up by coercive violence. The reason why revolutions were fought in North America, Haiti, and South America and Mexico uh, over the past 250 years and many other countries were for these reasons, sovereignty, decentralization, to get away from that centralized control, property rights, taxation and representation in government, free trade, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, personal liberty, equality, do justice before the law. These are the things that people fought and died for in each of the countries that was liberated. Now, what's interesting is we're still fighting for those things today. If you consider carefully what the people at Black Lives Matter were protesting about, it's many of the things on this list. And that's not all. Even the kooks who invaded Congress last January, they thought they were fighting for some of these things as well. These issues persist. These are the legacy of the colonial era. You see, what remains after colonization and even after the decolonization process is coloniality, which is a thought process. And we have coloniality baked into our legal system, our economy, our power structure, and it's also baked into our mentality. It's baked into our belief systems, our education system, and our perception. It, we have blind spots. Those blind spots are a legacy of the colonial system. And those blind spots are what are gonna lead us to replicating the colonial system unconsciously when we build out new virtual worlds. So my question is, what colonial's baggage are we going to carry into the virtual world? What colonial's baggage are we going to replicate in the metaverse? Beginning with the fact that our smartphones are addictive by design. When you talk to a game developer or someone who designs devices, they're quite proud to tell you that we've designed an addictive device, that we've designed, designed an addictive experience. In a sense, this is like a virtual opium war that's fought without drugs or without weapons. And what's being colonized isn't a piece of sovereign territory. It's your mind. It's your intention. It's your awareness. It's your imagination. It's your personality. It's your data that's being colonized. Right now, I see a very dangerous trend, which is that many of the corporate worlds that are being designed are going to encode colonial legacy into the metaverse. Right now, there's no concept of digital citizenship. There's no government. There's no self-determination or self-government in these worlds. What we see in these worlds is extreme centralization. You're not allowed to conduct free trade between one metaverse and another. That's exactly how a colony was ruled. Everything you buy in an online game today has to come from the company store. That's exactly what was done in the colonial era. We already see provable evidence of algorithmic bias against various groups in society. That's provable today. That might be carried forward. These worlds will consist of surveillance, society, surveillance capitalism. That's the business model of Web 2.0. That's going to be carried forward as well. These companies are focused on extracting data assets from the participants in the world. What's being commoditized here isn't the minerals or the wealth of a country. What's being commoditized is human identity in these digital worlds. Consider Meta as example one. A month ago, the Financial Times published a very interesting report 
about Meta's uh, recent filings, their patent filings. And in these patent filings, what Meta wants to do is track very carefully at a minute scale of detail, your facial gestures, your posture, your body position, your body type, and so forth, right down to like the pores of your skin and your hair type. They even have a thing called skin replicator. And you have to wonder like, why does Meta need that level of data? Well, in the report published by the Financial Times, they spoke to a researcher named Noel Martin in Australia. who said Meta aims to simulate you down to every skin pore, every strand of hair, and every micro movement. The objective is to create 3D replicas of people so hyper-realistic that they are indistinguishable from what is real. Why would they do that? Well, in truth, he thinks they're undertaking a global human cloning program. I know that sounds extreme, but the point is that what they're building are high fidelity replicas, basically digital twins of the users in this world. And what they're gonna do is use those twins to train AIs, to train machine learning algorithms so that they can perfect their marketing before they launch it on you. Basically, they're gonna create a digital twin of you and turn it into a slave that's put to work without any kind of payment to you. And the digital slave will be used to model and test advertising campaigns that'll be launched in the metaverse. Now let's talk about Roblox. Everybody knows Roblox, leading candidate to be one of the metaverse companies. And as everyone knows, famously, Roblox is all about the kids. And what this quote from the head of marketing at Roblox says is, from the very beginning, it was all about having kids develop games for other kids. That sounds great. Until you watch this video on YouTube called How Roblox Uses Child Labor to Increase Corporate Values. And that video investigation, which was done by uh, People Make Games, uh, that video investigation led to a whole series of reports that came out in various news, uh, news magazines about how Roblox is building uh, basically a game empire on ch child labor. The children make the game but they don't really get a chance to monetize them. Most children do not make money making those games. So they're working for free. There's the promise of the lure, the attraction that you might be able to make money, but you have to actually earn up to $1,000 of value before you can unlock it. And when Roblox actually does unlock that value and allow you to translate it back from Robux into dollars, well, they use a, a different um, exchange rate and they use an unfavorable exchange rate. So you don't actually get $1,000, you get a few hundred dollars in exchange. It's a really unfair system. I recommend you check out those videos to see exactly what's going on. These are not good practices. These are exploitative practices. And they remind me very much of the business model of the colonies, which I told you about just a second ago. Entire populations, societies and economies are managed for profit by a private corporation. What's missing is a bill of rights. What's missing is a declaration of the rights of man and women and the citizen. Those don't exist. What we get in digital worlds instead are contracts of adhesion, clip wrap agreements that you click through. They're typically called like a EULA, end user license agreement, or a TOS, terms of service, or a TOU, terms of use. Now, these are one-way contracts. They stick to you. That's why they're called contracts of adhesion. They stick to you, but not to the other side. The other side is able to arbitrarily change them anytime they wish. They can change any term in those contracts. If you read very carefully, those are the terms used. So that's what you have instead of a bill of rights because you're not a citizen. The core issue is that in, an, in a for-profit virtual world, we are subjects, we are not citizens. Now there are a number of perils of centralization and these are some of them. This idea that the tech companies are keenly aware of market leaders often benefit from increasing returns to the first company in the space. That's why they're all rushing to build their own corporate metaverses right now. And those increasing returns lead to a concentration of power that enable them to voice proprietary standards on their third-party developers. And those in turn build in lock-in, path dependency, and switching costs that make it very difficult for people to switch out of these worlds. And if you view this from a perspective outside the United States, it looks very much like data colonialism, where data, data assets are being seized by American corporations to perfect artificial intelligence and foist a kind of AI imperialism on the people who are there. So yeah, it's time to decolonize the metaverse. If we don't start now, when the heck are we going to do it? The revolution needs you, comrade. Now you want to wonder, well, where's this going? What's the alternative? Many folks on this call today have talked about Web3. And I know it's a little bit ridiculous to talk about Web3 because the technology is in its infancy. And candidly, it's not ready for prime time. And candidly, it's riddled with fraud and it's grossly inefficient at this stage. There are many, many, many deficiencies with Web3. I get it, I'm familiar with those things. I'm gonna ask us all to put that stuff aside for a second and consider the promise of Web3. Let's consider what Web3 is for, because it's at an early stage. Let's assume that those problems can be solved. What Web3 promises is societies are built on open source software where there's no hierarchy, 
where the world is owned by the community and managed by the community. It's accessible to anyone. You can come and go as you please. They are geographically unbound and they offer the prospect of permissionless innovation and creativity. That's what's being proposed by Web3. It's a grand vision. And I believe in a way it kind of replicates Mikhail Bakunin's vision of collectivist anarchy in the, in the, that he wrote about it in the 1870s. It's sort of like a modern day remix of that. The idea is in Web3, workers actually own the means of production. Now, it's kind of ironic considering that the crypto world is dominated by people who are right-leaning libertarians uh, that they would go for a collectivist anarchy. But in fact, if you look at anarchy, you know, we, we use that word today to talk about chaos or disorder, but that's not at all what Bakunin was talking about. He was talking about a place where there isn't a top-down government hierarchy. That's what he's talking about, the absence of a top-down hierarchy. And that's what Web3 offers, this idea of decentralized infrastructure where you can build kind of like an anti-corporation, a DAO, uh, what um, a little while ago Ed Saatchi was talking about. NFTs and tokens, those are simply the digital assets that can be traded freely by the people who create them and reward the people who create things. And the data is owned by the users. These are principal concepts that are put forth in Web3. What I want to point out for today's talk is that these are all dematerialized. Dematerialization is the thread that runs through these. We're talking about dematerialized corporations, basically dematerialized companies, organizations, on top of dematerialized infrastructure. The assets and money, those two are dematerialized, and they lead to dematerialized governance. At the end of the day, the data assets are dematerialized identity. And as though that might sound fanciful, and though there are many, many deficiencies today in the Web3 world, what's important to note that there are already examples of functioning token economies that do some parts of this, some or all of what I just described. And they exist in a number of different places, certainly DeFi, asset management, but also for content creation and the creation of digital items. You heard about NFTs just a moment ago from Catherine and from Kath and Caitlin. Um, there are also uh, uh, DAOs for, for social networking and for distributing computing power, data storage, other kinds of infrastructure, data management, and so forth. Even a 5G network is being built right now in a token economy. So this actually can work in practice, even though it's very early days. And so when I say the revolution needs you, I really mean it. I'm not joking. I, don't say, I say it with a tongue in cheek. But remember, the future is a choice. And right now, we're being given a choice. You can choose to live in a world dominated by a handful of companies that are worth five or $10 trillion that know every single thing about you and market to you relentlessly. Or you can choose to live in a world that is participatory, where you get rewarded for your participation and you own a stake in the outcome. You actually could contribute to and direct the growth and evolution of that society. That's the promise of Web3 and in particular of DAOs. It's why it's such an exciting prospect. And so even though it's a very early stage, I encourage you to consider this and to get smart about Web3 and DAOs, because I think if it works, a big if, it presents the best alternative to a world that's dominated by a handful of corporations. I'm Rob Tursik. I'm the author of Vaporized, and it's been my pleasure chatting with you.